from HanselMinutes.com. It's Hansel Minutes, a weekly discussion with web developer and technologist Scott Hanselman. This is Lawrence Ryan announcing show number 377, recorded live Thursday, June 27th, 2013. Support for Hansel Minutes is provided by Telerik, offering the best in developer tools and support. Online at T-E-L-E-R-I-K.com. And by Franklin's.net, makers of Gesture Pack, a powerful gesture recording and recognition system for Microsoft's Connect for Windows developers. Details at GesturePAK.com. In this episode, Scott talks with Mads Christensen about his newly open-sourced Web Essentials. Hi, this is Scott Hanselman. This is another episode of Hansel Minutes. I'm actually down here in San Francisco at Build. The sounds of sirens behind me. No doubt <laughs> some Windows machine somewhere is having trouble, and they've called the police. Um, and I've got Mads Christensen here. We're actually hanging out in my hotel room. Uh, we got the keynote is done, day one, day two, and uh, you presented at Build. I did, yes. Uh, what did you show? I showed a lot of uh, of the new cool stuff that came in uh, Visual Studio 2013 for web developers. So mm-hmm. a lot of new HTML capabilities, JavaScript, uh, and browser link. Yeah, br- code browser name link. Artery. Yeah, I like the name Artery better than that. Yeah, I know. But there's so, two things you're working on that are really cool, and I think browser link is one. We'll mm-hmm. talk about that a little bit, and then Web Essentials, which is kind of a side gig for you. It's actually not, you know, I wouldn't say it's it's sanctioned, but it's still your thing, right? You own it. Yes, yeah. yes. Let's, I'm the only developer on it, basically. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, let's talk about that first, actually, because Web Essentials is kind of this extension that you plug into 2012 or 2013. I think there was a version for 2010 as well. There is. The, the original version came out for 2010, but it's not as feature-rich. It mm-hmm. came in pretty late, uh, and then we started working on 2012, and I kind of just went ahead and, and, and worked on the version for 2012 early on. So the 2010 version does have a lot of features. Mm-hmm. Um, but not nearly as much as uh, as many as 2012. How many people have downloaded Web Essentials now? Um, we're probably pushing 500,000. Yeah, it's almost a half million. Yeah. It's almost become, I think, for front end web developers on the uh, on the .NET platform to be like essential. Like, you know <laughs> what I mean? Yeah. Um, I think that it is. Why isn't it included out of the box? Um, well, a lot of the features actually now are included out of the box. Mm. Um, but they started in Web Essentials because that's just it's a playground. It's where we test ideas and iterate over uh, possible solutions to problems that we all have, all front-end developers have. And um, and uh, so sometimes we don't actually get things right. Sometimes we know what a problem is, but we might realize that there are several solutions. And so we test them out. And, and we actually then measure like what works, what doesn't work. Mm-hmm. And when we think we got it, then we're going to move it in. So it's basically just a testing ground. Um, and it's also a way for people to get their hands on features way earlier than normal. Right. Um, because they start there. It's basically part of our specification uh, planning process, if you want, right? So so you get really early access to a lot of features. Yeah, I kind of... Uh, r- reminds me of... I use Gmail for my, my internet mail. And I I have... Uh, there's a feature in Gmail called Labs. Mm. And it's just random stuff. And like some of it might be... You know, embed YouTube videos, and other ones might be like change the way this button looks. And I think what they're doing is is that they're voting, and they're basically seeing how many people want that feature and how many people use that feature. Mm. And then every year or so, they'll graduate individual features into the main product. So then, like send an archive was a feature, and it yeah. moved into the main product. Um, are there things that are in labs that have shown up in 2012? Uh, there is, um, for instance, less and CoffeeScript. Less. Uh, less and CoffeeScript started in Web Essentials. Uh, so did syntax highlighting for um, mustache and handlebars. And even uh, paste JSON as classes actually started there. And mustache and handlebars, again, are not just funny nouns, <laughs> but are the names of templating engines. Yeah, they're, they're actual things. Yes. Yeah, they're real things, for those that may not know. Yeah, so, uh, I mean, uh, if you use Ember.js, for instance, then you're using handlebars probably mm-hmm. uh, for your templating. So we now have nice syntax highlighting. But all that started just as prototypes and experiments mm-hmm. in Web Essentials. Now, for me, I don't like running extensions in Visual Studio because I'm afraid that it destabilizes Visual Studio. I don't know if that's historical, maybe the old way that they used to do that, but I haven't had that many problems with Web Essentials like crash and stuff. No. Why? Does that mean that you're a better programmer than the no. other people or is there something about the way you wrote it? I, I hear, I hear actually hear from a lot of people the same concerns. Mm-hmm. And I, al- I actually also have them, not, not with Visual Studio anymore, mm-hmm. but 
Um, for instance, with browsers, kind of, we know that if you have a lot of plugins for your browsers, it slows everything down and, and we think that, well, it must be the same then for, for Visual Studio. But actually, uh, the way you hook things up in Visual Studio, that's not the case. For instance, you don't load a particular, um, extension for CSS, for instance, unless you open a CSS file. Um, so there, um, so I guess the, the, the nature is just different. So you're saying that if I load Visual Studio and Web Essentials, Web Essentials doesn't actually even load it when I'm sitting there, file no. a new project. Well, Web Essentials actually does load it because it, it, it does some things, but it does it in a non-blocking way. And the heavy lifting of everything that Web Essentials does, it doesn't do on solution load or when you open Visual Studio. Actually, Web Essentials doesn't run at all when you just open Visual Studio. When you open a solution, that's when it kicks in. Okay. Uh, but it doesn't really do much. It just registers some commands. And then after that, then... You have to invoke those commands. You have to be in the CSS editor, for instance, okay. uh, for those commands to be loaded. Now, editing, changing the way the editor behaves, the, the two main extensions that I think of when I think of changing how an editor behaves are uh, Code Rush and ReSharper. Yes. And they do you know, all sorts of crazy stuff. They're oh, painting yeah. over the top and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. When did extending the editors in Visual Studio become less scary and evil? Because you seem to be able to, I mean, you and I will have conversations late yeah. at night, and the next day you've gone and you've done the thing, yeah, and you've well, extended the editor in some I don't, weird way. I don't know if it if it if it has gotten that much easier. I think um, the the initial like the initial hurdle that you have to to kind of understand what's going on and understand the MEF structure of of um, MEF, the managed extensibility framework. Yeah, yeah, the, how 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 you can kind of inject your own code into Visual Studio. Um, you have to kind of understand how that works. It took me. Probably six months to to kind of understand it, but when you then get it and you already have code that does similar things, it's really really simple if you're just to copy and modify. Mm -hmm. And basically, that's what I do most of the I time. I see. So what you're saying is that there's things where that you might want to expand or hover over or identify a piece of information within mm -hmm. some CSS. And now that you've figured out the where that lives in memory, going and changing the color of something or putting a tooltip over something is not a big deal anymore. It's not a big deal. There's actually some good samples out there. You have to kind of know where to look and and it's not that obvious all the time. Um, but there are co there's code out there and you can just search for it and that's what I did. A lot of people think that, well, I work at Microsoft so I have direct access to those teams that build the different things in Visual Studio and that's why I'm able to do this. That's not true. So you're not I, using any undocumented I'm not. Crazy... I'm not like going over to some other team in Visual Studio and asking them how to do certain things. It's it's all stuff I find online or I discover interfaces or something like that that's in, um, that I can just see like that's in the uh, extensibility project. Mm -hmm. uh, so when you say file new extensibility project, uh, the SDK lays down a lot of uh, templates and, and, and DLL files that you can use and I just discover them there basically. Okay. Yep. So the thing that I think that Web Essentials is most known for is taking the CSS editor and just making it better. Because I remember seeing a presentation that you gave to the team that had some like bar charts and it was showing kind of like from zero to a hundred and it was like, oh, yeah. here's how good our CSS editor is. And in 2010, it was like, we're doing 30% of what we could do. And in 2012, we're doing, I don't know, I'm just making numbers up, 60% of what we're doing. And then you said, but if we just push a little harder, we could do like 98% or 100%. Yeah. yeah. And then, you know, sometimes people believe you and sometimes they don't. And then <laughs> sometimes you just go and do it. And that's one of the things that yeah. is a good way to get things done at Microsoft is to just simply do it. Just do it, yeah. And then go back later and, and show your boss that you did it. Yeah. You just went off basically and said, you know, I don't care what those guys say. I know what our CSS editor can do. And you basically yeah. just went and did it. Yeah, well, it it came from, it, yeah, well, it started out being my way of testing the CSS editor. So in 2012, we built a brand new one. And so we threw everything out that was uh, the old editor, which was the same editor that we've used always in Visual Studio. And we replaced it with a new one that had full extensibility. And our way of testing that extensibility model and making sure that the API was uh, as flexible as possible was to actually build extensions. So that's how it all started. So it just started as me actually testing mm -hmm. what a developer uh, was coding. And um, So the CSS editor in 2012 Mm -hmm. Even though it's, you know, it's text, right? It doesn't mm -hmm. look any different than anything yeah. else. It's completely rewritten. Completely. All managed code, all very nicely done. And compared uh, to 2010. Compared to 2010 and everything before it, it's, it's, it has a really nice API, probably the nicest API of all the editors, mm -hmm. um, at least to my knowledge. Um, and, um, and now we're doing the same thing with HTML, which is very exciting too. So in 2013, which they announced a couple of days ago, 
the exact same thing has been done to the HTML editor. Yes. So the razor editor, all that stuff, completely rewritten. Completely rewritten from scratch. And uh, the, the extensibility model is the same. Uh, the concepts are the same as CSS. So now we're going to have a, a, a more similar and familiar story. If so, mm-hmm. if you've ever done any extensibility on CSS, uh, transferring that knowledge to HTML is um, is pretty easy, actually. One of the things that I showed in the keynote, and I kind of snuck it in there, is I'm showing your stuff, right? Yeah, the, the, which is, you know, eh, it's kind of cool, <laughs> is a hovering over a CSS rule and then having real-world browser versions and saying, okay, this version of Opera and this version of Firefox, yes. et cetera, et cetera. Where, is it, are you loading that from a database? Or how do you know no, that no. stuff? That's actually pretty funny because that's in, that was in the box in 2012. That was not something that we loaded later on. It is it is in it, it the, the knowledge or it the tooltip? The knowledge. The tooltip came with Web Essentials, but the knowledge of the browsers came in the box. Oh, we just never did anything. Wait a second. So I know that in 2012, Mm -hmm. is it in 2010 or 2012? It'll give me squigglies and tell me if I'm doing something I shouldn't be doing. But it's not doing. It'll tell me like, oh, that's not CSS three. That's CSS. Oh yeah, that was 2010. Okay, that's when we did the web standards update. Right, right. Remember, but you're saying that it knows that transform works 3d transform works on ie 10 yeah and it just doesn't do anything with it correct where is it it's like in a database somewhere that's a crime <laughs> well no all the just like with xml actually oh sorry with uh the html letters or all the uh all the schema files that make up uh, the intelligence and validation of css actually it's just xml files somewhere within visual studio mm-hmm. install directory program files big visual chunk studio of somewhere. metadata yeah. It's actually very nicely structured, so you have one XML file per CSS3 module. So mm-hmm. it's really easy to navigate around in. And, uh, By CSS module, you mean? You mean I mean the that? actual CSS module by the W3C. Okay. So, so you putting have a that transform terms, module, yeah. you have a um, you know background and borders. Animation, and animations. Animations and so on. Yeah, the text module. I think there's like 40 of them. Right. Um, nicely structured. Very nicely structured, very easy to see how, how to work. I wrote a blog post a while back on how to actually add new schemas, and I had an example how to add khtml, which is the old WebKit oh. um, vendor prefix. So you're saying that if a new CSS module came out, theoretically, you could add that to Visual Studio and Web Essentials and not have to recompile anything. That's absolutely, that's exactly what Web Essentials actually does. I have, every three days, Web Essentials will see if there is an update to the schemas, and they will just download the new XML files. You're kidding. Where are you and looking for that? <laughs> online, on realworldvalidator.com. And what is realworldvalidator.com? Uh, See that you're just leading me down the primrose <laughs> path. This is, uh, yeah, I do have analytics on it and not a lot of visitors. Um, well, yourself. But, uh, <laughs> well, yeah. But basically, if you, yeah, I, I hijacked, um, F1 help, right? Mm-hmm. From CSS. So if you ever hit F1 when your cursor is on a property, you actually have you go told to anybody <laughs> that you hi- hijacked F1. No, I don't think That's so. That's awesome. Yeah. Okay. So if I have CSS open, and I, and if I rather, and I have web essentials. If I hit for help, yes, I will get your website. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> but for a good reason, though. Oh, yeah, I'm because sure. not for Google why, Ads. No, but it's <clears throat> why would you go to MSDN, which is what you normally go. Right. Why would you go you to want Why would you go to MSDN to learn about CSS? Yeah, yeah, it is not the natural place. So what I did actually was to, I didn't just put people on real world validator for the fun of it. It's actually because you can see in there very clearly. What browser supports what with right. link to the specification, with link to the modules, uh, all sorts of is metadata that kind of like that. Can I use dot com? Yes, very much indeed. Ah, yeah. Interesting. Okay. <clears throat> and where are you getting that information from? Well, that's that was manually gathered. That really? was so a you huge just went effort. and figured it out. Oh yeah. No, yeah. We went to can I use dot com and other places to kind of see all these things. Mm-hmm. Um but then it turned out that all these different sites actually disagree on a lot of things. How did you figure out the result like the <laughs> final word? Well, we tried it. Oh, so, just to see. Yeah. So, of course, we have contacts over in, at the IE team. So, they helped out ah, so on, you did on cheat. the IE thing. Uh-huh. And, uh, well, no, we needed that because we, we, of course, we want to make sure that we have everything that all the browsers support. So, mm-hmm. Bruce Lawson from Opera helped out with, oh, yeah. uh, with the Opera specific stuff and all cool. that. So, um, which, which actually brings me to another thing, the IntelliSense yeah. uh, and the CSS editor. Tell, tell me what's built in versus what's in Web Essentials. Because I know now that I can ha- type hyphen. O or hyphen MS, and I can get browser-specific prefixes. Yeah, that's built in. That's built in. So yeah. we'll get to, out of the box, I get that in 2012. So you get you get all the vendor specifics built in, and if you hit dash or hyphen first, and they all show up, that's all built in. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now I know that a lot of people, like for example, Leah Varu from the W3C, has been encouraging people to do things prefix-free, mm-hmm. and she might look at some aspects of a tool like. Uh, 
web essentials and think that, that promotes a world full of vendor prefixes. Yes. What do you think about that? And, and are you thinking about changing it such that it encourages the user in a different direction? Yeah. Um, that is a very, that is a very interesting thing because, um, we, we do not want to encourage bad behavior, right? And, and we also want to move as, as browsers stabilize. We want to make sure that we're ahead and we remove old vendor prefixes that are no longer used. And I got some emails. Um, actually I got a lot of tweets as well from people that all of a sudden was wondering, why do I not have any, uh, dash moss dash border radius and dash webkit border radius anymore? Mm -hmm. And that's basically because we updated the schema files mm -hmm. and web essentials goes out and checks for them. And they were no longer needed. So it keeps itself up to date. So it actually removes the vendor specifics that are no longer needed. And I think the rule I had um, back when I did that was if it's not supported, if, if the standard property is supported in Firefox 4, then I'm just going to remove the Mozilla version. And then I had the same kind of version. So you have a cutoff for, point. I had a cutoff point for each of the browsers, basically. Okay. So then let me ask you this. If I already have a CSS file that's using these, do you have a sweep function that will go and tie, you know, you're wincing because you know you need it. Uh, <laughs> yeah. That will go through and basically check disk. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? Like, where's my CSS lint? Yeah. Uh, no, it does not do that. It does it the other opposite way. Mm -hmm. It does it, um, if you, if you're missing any, it will tell you, but it will, it will not you. tell you. It will, it will, well, it will tell you if you have a vendor specific that no longer exists. It mm -hmm. will simply just say this does not exist. I see. Uh, but you have to delete it manually. Okay. Yeah. Now, one of the other things that you do is you augment in Web Essentials features that aren't necessarily features that you work on. So for example, yes. Howard and the team that works on, um, bundling and optimization, mm -hmm. they do their bundling and optimization, if I understand correctly, because they're on our team. Yes. I hope I better understand correctly. Uh, more mostly at runtime. Yes. Right. You know, you put together bundles, yep. but you have this cool feature. Well, actually, two uh, that take the idea of runtime minification and bundling of CSS, and mm -hmm. you have like open a CSS file, hit Control S, yes, very natural gesture, uh -huh. and then a dot min shows up next to it. Yes. Which is save time. Yes. And then you've got this idea of a bundle file that's like a little XML file that says mm -hmm. these are a bundle, and then you will hook into that. Yeah. And I could even put it into build time. So they've got a lot of different choices about when I could do that. Well, the, actually, there is no build time for either bundling or minification in Web Essentials. There are no MS build hooks at all. No. Um, but for bundling and minification, actually, the, the official NuGet, or sorry, the Howard's team that does the system right, web the official optimization, Microsoft they're actually coming one. out. Yeah, they're coming out with the bundling and minification uh, MS build time. Oh, so they are. Okay, so that, that's how, so I misunderstood. Yeah. So they will have runtime and build on the web, on the, on the, um, on the official side, rather, yes. pardon me. And then we'll have save time. Yes. Now, could the save time mess up? Like, could you fight with their feature? Um, no, not really, because all, they're all runtime. So they will take whatever CSS file you have registered with the runtime component. Mm -hmm. And whether or not that, that, um, whether or not that CSS file comes from, you know, it has been generated through a, right. a bundling mechanism in Web Essentials or, or not. That right. doesn't really matter. Well, what's the value then of Web Essentials sa uh, saving a minified version on, uh, when I hit save? Um, if I choose not I, to use... Yeah, it's a personal bundling. choice, I think. I see. So uh, if I choose not to use runtime bundling, it might just be there waiting for me ready to go. Yeah. I mean, I, I like uh, runtime bundling for a lot of a lot of things. And then for some things, I, I don't actually like it. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people, they, they they like to serve all their static files statically. Right. Yeah, right. that's a good point. So they, they just want the files well, Because you understand on what's happening and you know. Yeah. So let's say, though, that so I'm starting to realize that this is a lot of work. And you are all by yourself putting together a crap load of work and what happens if you get hit by a truck and web essentials is just going to sit there on your hard drive and we'll never know <laughs> well what, what happened well that that was a real problem until last friday when i open sourced the whole thing ah so now it's actually out in the wild it's on github so, so it's on github and i can like i could add yep. a new module or do something yep. cool with yep it. that's i hope you will Ah. I hope you will. I, I'm really eager to see what people will come up with, uh, because there's been a lot of interest in helping out from the community, mm -hmm. and it hasn't really been possible before. But now we finally figured out how to open source it, and mm -hmm. in a, in a good way, and now it is. So hopefully we're going to see a a, a a way bigger momentum coming uh, right. going forward here. Now on the you said that in 2012 we updated the CSS editor so it would be very flexible and got a great new API for extensibility, which made all of the cool stuff you did possible. Yes. Now in 2013, we are doing the exact same thing to the HTML editor. Yes. What crazy stuff might I now want to do? 
in well, Web Essentials. And is that hooked up so that someone could go and see the hooks that are ready, oh, yes. ready and waiting for there's, crazy there's stuff? There is already stuff in there. So I've already added smart tags. So if you want to add smart tags that are... So a smart tag you know from C Sharp, it's that little thing that shows up whenever you implement uh, an interface, for instance. It shows up a little uh, glyph, like yeah. a little... A little context menu. And a little just, context menu yeah. on the actual item itself. Mm -hmm. So in this case, that item could be an attribute. It could be an HTML element. Okay. And you can invoke that. Uh, control comma will open it up. And you can basically do whatever you want. And because you have... Control uh, comma or control dot? Oh, sorry. Control dot. Yeah, okay. sorry. Two different features. Um, so, but anyway, since you have full access to the, to the, to the tree, mm -hmm. the HTML tree or DOM tree or whatever you want to call it, um, you can manipulate all you want. So, so we ship... Uh, out of the box, we we have features that will automatically add a height and a width attribute to mm -hmm. an image, uh, or base sixty four encode it. And I've added uh, other stuff that will convert an image to a figure, an HTML five figure tag. Um, ah, I wonder if I could do something cool with SVG and Illustrator files, or yep. come up with some way to do that. Oh yeah, like now when you something that we couldn't do before that seems very basic is when you have an image tag. Mm -hmm. And you point to an image somewhere. Right, which I do all the time, right? You want to just yeah. take a foo.png and drag it in yeah. and go image source equals. Yeah. And then now when you take your cursor over it, we can actually show a little preview of that image, just as we could in CSS. Inline in the HTML. Inline in CSS. It's just like a hover tooltip. Well, what other metadata might be inside of that image file that I might want to then bring yep. in? That's exactly You can do whatever you want. If you Height can, and width. Height and width is what we're already doing with the smart tag. Um, to insert that. But you can, you can extract all sorts of stuff. And even if it's like a remote resource, you can go download that and do all mm -hmm. sorts of analytics on it. Um, um, for instance, if you have a script blog or a style blog, you can now say export to its own file. Like add a smart tag for that. You can kind of clean up. You can do a lot of refactorings. Hmm. Uh, all those things become, now become possible because we changed uh, the HTML editor, we updated it to this new version. What about a, a Twitter bootstrap specific thing so that I could say button and then see what are the choices of different button styles that and then a preview of what the button might look like yes. as I'm doing it? Huh? That would, that would be actually not that hard. See, that's what I like hearing. It would not yes. be that hard. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's cool. Yeah. Okay. So the second thing that you're doing, and I got to show this a little bit and you can see it on the keynote if you go to channel nine. Dot msdn com is this thing called browser link. Now yes. I like codename artery. Yes, but somebody pointed out that arteries only flow blood in one direction. Yeah, and this is a dual directional link between the browser and Visual Studio. Yes, it's a bi directional communication channel, all implemented in open standards, web sockets, JavaScript, HTML. So you have a web server. Yep. Inside of Visual Studio yes. editor. Yes. Yes. Is it in the editor or where does it? No, live? it's no, it's it's somewhere within the Visual Studio process. It's a it, basically what it is. It's a self-hosted Signal R HTTP listener. Signal R being the real time framework that we're using in ASP.NET. Yes. Yeah, so it's basically like the way that we host web sockets, and because it's based on Signal R, mm -hmm. it means that we support all the browsers that Signal R supports, even browsers that do not support uh, web sockets. We will then fall back through right. Signal R to long. Uh, polling but then SignalR supports pretty much anything. I mean, Opera yeah. Mini or whatever, oh, yeah. they support all that stuff. Everything, yep. Okay, so wait a second. So now in the keynote, I showed dual or bi-directional communication between uh, Visual Studio, IE, and Chrome. Can I maybe hook it up to an iPhone someday? Yes, you can. Ah. So uh, I, actually demoed, um, I actually demoed how to use the iPhone emulator. Mm -hmm. And... Um, and there's absolutely no problem. It, it hooks up with WebSockets. There, it just works. So it doesn't really matter what browser you've got. Um, what about a device? How would I hook that up to a device? Yeah, so we've we done some investigation on hooking up to a device because that, that's the cool demo. Right, because right? it's not necessarily on localhost, but it might be yes. somewhere else. Or I might want to do a localhost tunnel of some kind. Yeah, so the problem is firewalling. Right. You have, if you want to connect from, let's say you have your Windows phone and you want to type in your, your, you know, you have a workstation and now from your Windows phone, right. you want to type in the server name. Well, but they're on the same on network. Name. I should be able to make it so I could get IIS Express, yes. the development version of IIS, outside and available and hooked up on port mm. anything yes. quickly. So there's nothing that prohibits us of doing that. What, what the problem is right now, or no, not the problem, the challenge is how do we, how do we do that in a very, very easy way? Because right now you actually have to open up firewall ports and everything to make that communication possible. And that, that's, that's the challenge. Right. So Even it's not being, because it's impossible. It's just, yeah. it's just very difficult right now. And it doesn't people. have anything to do with 
with browser link slash artery. In this Correct. case, I just have to figure out, I mean, you can do it now, probably. Yeah. I would, the idea is we're not using IIS in this case. We are using IIS Express. So it needs to be answering with your browser's, yes. with your computer's host name on a certain port, yeah. firewall open. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Using IIS, I suppose I could do this today, couldn't I? Um, yeah, but bef- well, you're still, you're still going to run into that firewall issue. Oh, to talk WebSockets into Visual Studio itself. From a remote device, right? So, so you still have the same, um, no, not the WebSocket, just accessing the actual website. If you can see the website, then we can also have browser link hooked up. Uh, but getting from your phone and, and actually seeing mm-hmm. your IIS site on your server is, is okay. problematic. But that could be like, what is it called? Adobe Shadow? Yes. It could be like that, where I have yes. all these devices sitting on my desk. Yep. We actually had a prototype running of a Windows 8 app that was opening a UDP channel <laughs> that would uh, that would actually do that. Wow. Um, so you could kind of go around any firewall issues and all that stuff. But... Um, but that that didn't seem to be the right approach. So, but that was just a prototype. But the the fact is, or the where we are right now is that we are actually limiting. Um, the request has to be local. So right now, until we figure this out, we're actually for security reasons, we're actually limiting it to be only the the same developer machine can access sure. it. That makes sense. Yeah, S- interesting. The the thing that it's implemented first and the one that people can see and use and play with today and explore mm. is the idea of this browser refresh. Yes. So I can hit control alt enter or I can hit the button and I can take is there some limit? N number of browsers? There is no limit. So lots of browsers, you know, someone yeah. in development might have four or five. Yeah. Um and then hit refresh. Mm. But that's more of a it's all, um and I'm not trying to disparage your work, but it's almost like just a proof of concept. Like you've shipped a proof of concept from a feature perspective. What's interesting isn't that feature Live refresh mm-hmm. or auto reload. What's interesting is the the underlayman, the communication framework is solid. Yep. Signaler is proven. Yep. So now it's like Web Essentials. You've got the hooks in. Mm-hmm. Now it's what kind of crazy thing could you think up? Yep. I was thinking about what if I made it so I was filling out a form and I was typing in one browser and then it typed at the same time in all the other browsers. Yeah, yeah. Would that be weird? I mean, that seems like a great idea. That would be weird, but it's it's really cool, and that's what I built, right? So Did you have that too? Yeah. You're lying. No. You're kidding. You didn't see that? No. Okay. I just made that up. Really? I'm totally serious. I swear to God, I just had that idea. Okay, well... When did you do that? Go watch my, the Channel 9 video. You're kidding. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Very cool. So yeah. you're going to... Oh, wow. All right. So yeah. then, you mailed, you, did you build that? Like a, what is it? An extension of some kind? That's an extension. That took me, I'll guess, maybe eight minutes to write that. What happens if it gets out of sync? I guess well, it really can't because you're going on a name value pair basis, huh? It, well, it, why would it get out of sync? I don't know. Maybe the, you type oh, too oh. fast and one browser has different behavior than another. Yeah, yeah. So you need, to, you need to see the talk because I actually show off something that's really funny as well and cool. I'm not sure how useful it is, but that's the whole point. Well, of that's this, the whole point. Right? It's an experiment. Like, let's but I have, lab. I have one. Let's say that you have two browsers open and you're on the same URL. Mm-hmm. And let's say one of the browsers, you now scroll down to the bottom of the page because right. that's the part that you're not working on, right? Mm-hmm. Now, what if you want all your other browsers to kind of scroll down to that same location? I've implemented, so if you hit Control alt enter in your browser, all the other browsers will align to that. So if, if they're on the same URL, they will scroll to the same position. But if they're on a different URL, they will navigate to the right URL. So you can kind of sync up your browsers. And basically what it is, it's just a, it's a browser to browser communication where they just relay that communication over the browser link. I see. But if you open up a new URL, yes. that next URL has to in, um, reattach that connection. The, every time there's a refresh going on, they, they, um, they reconnect, yes. Mm-hmm. But that's really fast. That's not, that's not something you're going to notice. That's really cool. Yeah. Yeah. So right now we are working on how to do live CSS update. So yeah. the one I showed was every time you save the CSS file, all the, the browsers just refresh the CSS files, not the actual, not the whole page. Not the whole page. So it's instant. How do you do that? You'd have to basically go and run like a reset and then reapply them all. Yeah, it's actually very, very simple. I'll show you the code. It, it's probably ten lines of JavaScript altogether. Uh-huh. Uh huh. But basically, I just I just run through all the the linked style sheets mm-hmm. and basically just attach a um, like a random number to the query string. Uh-huh. That makes well, that makes the browser them. reload them. Okay, let yeah. me ask you this then, and this is a more controversial question. In a world where a lot of developers are doing Chrome and Dev Tools and Sublime. What's the point of a of a big fat quote unquote IDE like Visual Studio? You know, it's You've got keep, things like Project Meteor and yes. all these different things. You know, for me, it's 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 about productivity. It's about that I'm in, I'm in one tool 
And the, the more I can stay there and productive, the better. What I really don't like is that I have to go search for stuff, uh, online and I have to use console apps and I have to use all sort of command line tools and just different tools in general to do the stuff that I have to do every day. Mm-hmm. Um, and all that context switching for me is like really problematic and it gets me out of the zone. You know, you know, as a developer, we get in the zone. I want to exactly. stay there as long as possible. And I can do that if I can get away, get, all friction away, and if I can minimize um, all the time that my environment kind of gets in the way. Mm-hmm. So we want to get the details right. We want to get the IDE out of the way. And actually, we want to be a little bit better than that because we want something that's called the thinking IDE, if you're going to think of that. The thinking IDE. The thinking IDE. How can we get the IDE to be knowing what your next move is going to be mm-hmm. and then present it to you? What as ab- you need it. What about a way that, I mean, I'm always changing CSS in dev tools in Chrome. When I get it right, I want to push it back down into my, my IDE and into the N number of CSS files. You know what I mean? So I yes. change a rule. I could go and update that rule using Chrome as the authoritative source. Yes. That would be cool. That would be really cool. And we're, we're actually looking into doing that. Um, we know how to do that. So, That's cool. Uh, we have the technology to do that we have uh, the through technology. the uh, through browser link. Uh, we 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 know what to do. Mm-hmm. Now it's just a matter of actually doing it. But we need to get the infrastructure done first and all those things. So okay. but it's something that we're going to look at because what we really want is that people should use the workflow that they want, mm-hmm. right? If they if they want to use Chrome DevTools to to do all their pixel pushing, um, they should do that, and we should just have the option of giving them the safe button in Chrome mm-hmm. or in Firebug or or IE or you know, wherever they're comfortable yeah, yeah, and have that saved back. And we do know how to do all those steps. Hmm. It's just a matter of actually getting it done. So hmm. you can expect something like that to be coming down the line. And people can see, okay, so people can go to GitHub on your personal GitHub to yes. see your uh, Web Essential stuff yes. and get involved. Uh-huh. And they can go to Channel 9 and build and they can see your talk that you did at Build, which hmm. apparently I saw in my dreams because I swear <laughs> I totally had that idea and you've yeah. already built it. That's crazy. That is when I have of- an idea and you've already built it, as I have the idea, yep. that makes me feel uh, a little creepy. Yeah, I built it last week. You built it last week, too? Yeah. yeah. Oh, my goodness. All right. Well, thanks so much for talking to me. Yeah, thanks for having me on. This has been another episode of Hansel Minutes. I'll see you again next week. <laughs>